Hi, everybody. Waiting for next year.com podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking to TD about all things sports. He is one of the biggest followers of NCAA basketball that I know all the way along throughout the season, not just once March hits, not just once the brackets are released. So we will be talking to him. First of all, we're, we're going to talk about that NCAA tournament. We're also going to talk about Terrell Pryor and some other things. But before I call TD, um, I'm going to talk to you about Patreon. We've got a, a number of new people showing up every single week, every single month, and it's been really great. Um, so happy to have new people on board. That's the only way that we know of to support this website. Our advertising doesn't cover a lot of bills, and what we're trying to do is continue to add to the offerings. We're trying to corner the market on the best writers in the mar- in, in in all of Cleveland and all the best podcasters, and we've got big plans. So please help us out if you can. It's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash w-f-n-y. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash w-f-n-y. Give a little, give a lot, give whatever you can. If you can't, tell somebody about it. Help us out with the podcast. And now I'm going to dial up TD. Waiting for next year. Waiting for next year. With the recent news of Jason Kipnis being injured, there's nobody who I'd rather weigh in on this topic with than TD, uh, among other topics. But first of all... Um, how how did you take the Kipnis news? Do you think it's it's a big deal, a small deal? Is there a secondary part of the story for you? Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I was reading a lot on Twitter, and I know that our our very own Scott Sargent is, is feels this way. It, you know, there there seems to be a I don't want to say distrust, but but there's something going on with how sometimes the Indians are being viewed with how they. Um, announce their injuries. It seems like, you know, maybe it's because of Brantley or Grady Sizemore over the years or whatever it might be. But, you know, last year was, we heard a lot about Michael Brantley and, Oh, he was, you know, he was on schedule. He was on schedule. Then all of a sudden he wasn't. And then he came back and then he was going to be okay after about four or five weeks. And then all of a sudden he was out for the year. So I don't know. I, to me, when he first was, you know, two or three days shut down, I began to think, okay, You know, this is a little bit worrisome. We've seen shoulders with Travis Hafner and Grady and 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 Michael Brandley, and now this. And you know, I was hoping that it wasn't going to be much. You know, he was in there swinging and 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 looking good, and they DH'd him. But you know, you never know until the next day. And obviously, he showed some soreness. And I'm hoping, and I believe them when when I when I say that. You know, they're taking they're being very uh, cautious here. I mean, there's. There's no reason to rush the way the division looks. I mean, the Indians should run away with the division if you're looking strictly on paper. I mean, we know games aren't played on paper, but so if he has to sit out, you know, two or three weeks to start the season, it's not the end of the world rather than rushing him this, you know, uh, back quickly and then really losing him the way that they lost Brantley last year. Cause I think if they could do it all over again, they would have held Brantley out longer. You know, it was, it was almost like they painted themselves in a corner with this. He'll be ready by opening day even though he wasn't and he kind of got rushed back. And I just think that they saw that last year and it's got to be affecting them uh, in some way, whether it's, you know, directly or indirectly, it's got to be affecting them. So yeah, I'm I'm concerned, but you know, it's, it's, as I have said to you many times, baseball is a marathon, not a sprint. And yeah, these games in April are important, but the way this team looks, they should be there in October and you want them as healthy as possible then. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing, though, you know, when you're looking at an organization and how they deal with things. I don't really pay attention to other baseball teams around major uh, around the majors. I really don't. So when I look at the way the Indians talk about their own injuries, I don't have a frame of reference for how other teams do it. All my only frame of right. reference are the other sports in Cleveland, you know, the football and basketball. Um, and I, I, I guess I probably know more about the NFL's injury reporting than any other because it's, it's a big part of that sport in terms of, uh, the rules and fantasy, even though I don't play fantasy anymore. Once, you know, when I did, it was a big, you always knew kind of how that stuff was reported. And so, I, it's, it's a weird thing. You know, are the Indians, do they obfuscate? Are they, are they bad at the way they report this word? Thank you. (laughs) Or is it, or is it just 
kind of are they just as good and and as everybody else? Is there anything different as to how the Indians are doing? Do you have any perspective about how the rest of the majors handles this kind of stuff? I do. I think most teams are the way the Indians are in terms of transparency. Um, and I actually think that the Indians are one of the more transparent organizations that you're going to find. Um, I think a big part of the reason why it seems like they're not is because they're not a national brand the way the Yankees or the Cubs or the Red Sox, one of those teams, because when those teams have major injuries, the national guys seem to be more in tune, you know, with, with what's going on inside the clubhouse there. It's the big cities. They, you know, like ESPN has, you know, a Yankees guy, you know, they have ESPN New York, they have, you know, so, so it's, it's kind of like, I feel like those markets and those kind of situations dictated a little bit more, but even during the, the one thing I used to like about Mark Shapiro was, and this, this kind of speaks more to what's going on in, off the field than on the field, but whenever there was an off the field incident, like let's say the Chris Perez drug bust thing, the Indians used to be out in front of that stuff way before it ever got out. And, you know, Shapiro would go out there. He'd say what he'd have to say. They'd get out in front of it. And it would kind of like you would, I, I just, I remember thinking, you know what? Good for them in terms of transparency, because the Browns were never trans this transparent. Um, I mean, I can't speak to the Cavs, but and I think it's different because there's only 12 players or, or, or whatever, but, you know, I don't think the Indians are any different than any other team. I just think that it's our local team and we care more. So it just seems that way. Does that make sense? I mean, I, it I does. It I, does. And and I'm not sure that, you know, especially if you go back towards the, the history and you look at Grady Sizemore and Travis Hafner, I mean, they weren't going to tell you that there were some concerns when they trade about him about degenerative, you know, they, they, that's like course, more yeah. of a long term thing. Um, and, and I don't think they can report every up and down of the Michael Brantley situation, but I also don't think that they can be so defensive as to question as, as to get defensive every time somebody questions their handling of injuries. Well, I, 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 I think, well, who gets defensive? Like I, I, I haven't seen, I mean, other than like Hoynes getting defensive, but he doesn't work for the team. I don't see them like I don't see Chernoff and Antonetti as as guys who get defensive on that stuff. I think that they have a way they do things, and it's you know that, that's just the way they handle it. I don't. I personally don't find them being defensive on the subject. I think that they are now overly cautious because of Brantley, and I think that's why that they're doing what they're doing now. Um, you know, they're, they're not hiding anything. They could have just said, you, you know, they shut down Kipnis for a few days. They put him back out there and then he was sore again. So now they're shutting him down. Like, I, I don't know what more they're supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? Like, what are they supposed to say at, at the end of the day? Oh, he felt a twinge in his shoulder, that specific at bat. So we've decided to shut him down. Like what's, the, you, you know what I mean? Like, what's the difference there? I, I, I personally don't see it, but I can understand why, because of what happened in years past that people do feel that they are handling it, you know, could be handling it better, but I personally think they're fine. Yeah. Well, and, and I do think the Indian and maybe it's wishful thinking on their part, but I do think they downplay their, their injuries. But uh, then again, I don't, you know, I don't but doesn't, know. What, I, I think everybody, I think everybody does though. You know, you don't want maybe it's also, you don't want to let your opponent know that, you know, in a certain way, I, I mean, I guess baseball is different because it's a longer season, you know, than say the NFL, but I don't know. I I think, you know, it's strategic in a way too. You don't want to let your opponent know your weaknesses. I I, I don't know. Here, what's important now is getting, uh, getting Kipnis and Brantley for that matter, as healthy as they can possibly be and to be clicking at the right time and hopefully make another deep October run. And I think if sitting him out in a, you know, two or three weeks and having him, you know, ramp up, uh, and be ready maybe by May 1st or last week in April is going to help you long term then that's what you do. Well, and there's one thing that that does ring ring true just generically speaking and that's what Andre Knott was saying on the A to Z podcast. Of course, he works, you know, works for the team and he's close to him, but these games are meaningless for a guy like Jason Kipnis. If 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 he needs to sit these games out, it's like LeBron sitting out preseason games. It it he's not right. LeBron, but it just doesn't matter. Right, right. I mean, it's a timing thing. I mean, whether he gets hits or not, obviously, doesn't matter. And 
So if he takes a little bit longer to get his timing down, it's, again, it's not the end of the world. It's not, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the baseball is not basketball where it's five guys on the court and it's not like, you know, if, if Kipnis takes an 0 for 4, it's not like the Indians are going to lose. Whereas if LeBron takes an 0 for 10 or 0 for 12 or, you know, 2 for 14 or whatever, they're going to lose. It's oh, just, yeah, they're not winning. You know, yeah. So, I don't know. I am, ex- I, you know what, I am excited to see, though, is if this Kipnis injury, well, number one, I'm hoping it doesn't linger, but I, I'm excited to see if this Kipnis injury does, you know, linger what they will do. Will they move Jose Ramirez to second base, which, you know, he's more, he's, he, his best defensive position is second base, by the way, and always has been. Whether they move him to second base and give Yandy Diaz that third base uh, job and say, go for it. I mean, there's no doubt he's ready major league with the bat. You know, the glove, you read that he's a suspect glove, but, you know, it, it, J-Ram made himself into a nice third baseman. Uh, I don't see why Yandy can't, but the Yandy Diaz can rake, and I, I would love it if he was the opening day third baseman if Kipnis has to start in the DL. Well, it's really funny, too. I, I can't remember whether it was in their podcast or in the chat behind the scenes with the EHC guys, but there was some talk about, you know, okay, the team that experimented with Carlos Santana at third base is so worried about defense that they couldn't let, you know, some of these young guys man third base for, for a minute. Um, and you gotta, I kind of got to agree with that. If guys' bat is major league ready... You know, it's uh, let them let them give, like, give yeah, it a shot. It, yeah, it's not like Yandy didn't isn't a third baseman and they're just putting him there. I mean, he <laughs> played third base in the minor leagues. So, I mean, I saw yesterday. You know, and I I you know often get into these conversations with Jim and Mike. You know, on Twitter, and I, I did see somebody suggest the other day that well, why not move Lonnie back to third? I just to me that's not. I have no interest in that. Like. Why do we keep holding back Yandy Diaz? Like last year, to me, he should have been up here in September to prove that he is back. I would have rather if – listen, you have to see how he was going to be in September, but why he didn't get a call up is beyond me unless it had something to do with c- control. Um, but I would have liked to have seen him in September because obviously, you know, I, I, my, my 2017 spring training credo for the Indians is ABM, anyone but Martinez. I do not want to see Michael Martinez on this roster ever again. I, I know, oh, he's versatile. He can play a lot of positions. I saw, he's, you know, he's got a cannon for an arm in the outfield if he's got to play. He's one of the worst. It's not hyperbole. The statistics back it up. He's one of the 10 worst players statistically of the last 25 years. Why? Why? T- and again, we should never question Tito and I am the first one to, to, to say that every time I question him, the guy pulled every right string in October and I, you know, it, it does an incredible, incredible job. But his affinity for Michael Martinez might be the most frustrating thing uh, of, that, that that's going on right now. I just don't understand why they continue to love this. It's not like he's a young up and coming guy. I think he's 34. <laughs> so he, he is I just 34. don't want him on the roster. Yeah. I don't want him on the roster. I don't like, why, why can't Eric Gonzalez be on the roster? He's already on the 40 man. We got to waste a 40 man spot on Michael Martinez again. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, and, and for a team like this that now has Encarnacion to go with all the pieces that they had last year, like you're telling me they can't use a spot on a rotating cast of young guys to see if somebody could stick in that kind of utility, you know, role. That's that's sure. that's one of the things I love about baseball by the way is as I love you know it's one of the only only sports maybe the only sport where you get to check out the prospects kind of in major league action cuz the, the sample size is so big 162 games that there's time and and at bats and games that you can kind of experiment with guys who otherwise like if the playoffs started tomorrow wouldn't play at all Exactly um although we did right which is great you know, unfortunately, the way the roster shook out last year, you know, someone like Michael Martinez ended up being the 25th guy. And then we had him in the World Series being used multiple times. I mean, I know what you're talking about with the 40 man and the expanded rosters, but, you know, at that point. No, the idea is to it, replace Michael Martinez before that point this with year. One, no, that, right. That, that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. See, that's why Yandy should have gotten the call up so they could have known if they could have used him. But why they didn't. I, I just I don't understand. Are you saying you rather Gonzalez. would have rather had Yandi up in uh, the Game Seven of the World Series than Michael Martinez? 
Craig, I think I would have rather had you up in that spot. <laughs> Okay, you may have closed your eyes and made better contact. I don't know. But, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm wondering sure if the, wasn't, there nice pitch, wasn't there a pitcher? Wasn't there a pitcher who could yield, you know, wield the bat better than Michael Martinez in that spot? They could. Well, Kluber was already out. He's and, and Tomlin was. No, they could have used Tomlin. Tomlin's the best hitting pitcher the, the Indians have. They, they should have just sent him up there. But they would have had to use him in the field oh. at that point. Is that we were out of players? That's why he. It's it is so funny during and, and I don't want to go back to Game Seven because it's too depressing. But during Game Seven, when uh, uh, there was a pass, it was either a pass ball or a wild pitch. I think it was a pass ball on Jan, and because of it, Dexter Fowler ended up on second. And because of it, Coco has the pop, you know, the worst arm of all time in left field. And so, because he was on second with two outs in scoring position, Tito yanked Coco and put Michael Martinez in the outfield. And I turned to my brother who was sitting with me and I go, you just know that Coco's spot's going to come back up and Michael Martinez is going to have to bat. And of course the spot ended up coming back at the worst possible time with two outs in the, you know, in, in the tying run on base. But yeah, that's either here nor there. We can't, I don't want to go backwards. I'm all about 2017 and moving forward and winning a world series this year. God, how much fun was the return of Coco crisp? I mean, you think about think about how many big hits he had. He, had, I know he won. Uh, he had a huge hit against Toronto. I know he had, a, uh, he had the one uh, the game winning hit against Boston. Game hitting hit against Boston. Game yeah. winning hit against ga- game winning hit uh, in the one nothing game in, in Chicago. Game three. Oh. He was incredible and great clubhouse guy. Really fit in perfectly. He he's he's not currently on anybody's team either, which no. is interesting. I, fi- I you know, he, he could retire. I'm sure he's made enough money in his life. Oh, for sure. Um, but what's interesting is he would have been a guy who probably would have just had the Indians one just retired and said, I'm done. Go out on top. Why not? Yeah. Like, no. And like, I think we've, like, I think we've like talked Rocky. about him before where he yeah. was the, per- he's a perfect Indians outfielder and they, he should have played every game of his career. Cause he never made, he, he was never a threat to make $20 million a year, but he was always within the Indians' price range, and he was always relatively yep. productive. Yeah. yeah. He, well, you know, he was on – the, the reason why the Indians were able to get him was because he was reaching incentives. Uh, he was going to reach uh, um, to trigger a $13 million um, option for this year in it, on the bats, and the A's didn't want to do it. So they literally gave him away knowing he wouldn't reach that uh, number – with us and then he became a free agent but i think he made 13 you know 13 plus million dollars over the last few years i mean all right so here's he here's, the, here's the deal up on baseball he made he made he made hang on a second he made 82 million 82.6 yep. million his entire career it's crazy and yeah, he made so 22 million in his last two years yeah 11 and 11 the last two years beautiful yeah, i mean listen Oh, in his thirties, five million, five point seven, six million, seven million, seven point five, eleven, and eleven. That's pretty good. It's All amazing. day long. I mean, it's, yeah, he would have been the Not perfect that, Indians that. lifer. Yep. <laughs> Oh, 80, Eighty-two million dollars is a lot of money, but not for the Indians over fifteen seasons. <laughs> That's a great, great point. Great point. <laughs> All right, let's move great along. Point. Let's move along. Um, we're going to finish with the NCAA, but uh, let's talk about Terrell Pryor for a second. I've spent a lot of time talking about it. It's been all over the pages of WFNY, and, and I promise we're going to end. We're not going to keep talking about that forever. But I mean, you're a you're historically been a, a Cleveland Brown season ticket holder. What do you make of all that? I, you know, there's got to be something more to the story. They're either it, it's either they didn't like his attitude anymore and thought he was, you know, too big of an ego, or Hugh didn't want him, or it just it something doesn't add up here. I saw that Mary Kay was, or was I think it was Mary Kay was reporting that Rosenhaus came back to the Browns and said, "This is the offer on the table, match it." I just. It, something doesn't add up. He turned down four years. The, the, correct me if I'm wrong. He turned down four and thirty-two during the season as an extension. Yeah, four is and that, thirty-two with with somewhere Guar- north seventeen guaranteed. Yeah, like somewhere that, north right? of fifteen guaranteed. And nothing really changed, other than the market dictated that he was going to make a little bit less. But and they signed Kenny Britt. 
and they signed Kenny Britt for that same amount of money. But wouldn't, wouldn't you would think that at that point and his market dried up, maybe, you know, I, I just got to believe it's one of those things like Mitch Schwartz a couple years ago, which I know this for a fact. It's not just a reported thing. It's an actual fact the Browns put that offer out to him. He didn't take it, then came back and said, we want to be here. Let's, let's do something. And the Browns had pulled the offer. I think that the same situation happened. They told Pryor, here's your last offer. Take it or leave it. Rosenhaus and, and Pryor said, we want to see the market. And they took the deal off the table. And then when they signed Britt, they decided, well, we drafted 85 receivers last year. And now we signed Kenny Britt. So we don't want you anymore. It's something just doesn't add up to where, where he's only getting $8 million in Washington for one year Unless it's, I'm going to bet on myself. I know that Kirk Cousins is only going to be there for one year, also betting on himself. And I'm going to be the top guy. We're both going to blow up this season. And then I'm going to hit the free agent market next year and see what I can get. Those are the only explanations I have. Right. But let's talk about this for a second. So if you're the Browns and you go into back-to-back years with guys that you weren't able to get the extension done before they hit free agency and you end up being right that their market is not what they think it's going to be, and you end up not being able to take advantage of the fact that you were right, isn't there a flaw in their process? Oh, big time. I mean, I I, I mean, I, I believe you're in the same boat as me. You wanted prior back. I think they put they put all these resources in the last two years into developing him into what he's become. And it, and you got Corey Coleman. You I mean prior you know it's it just to me look at what he did with no quarterback an offensive line that was you know couldn't protect and he still looked like a total stud he's a big physical guy out there i, I just to, to me after putting in all that time and letting him walk it just doesn't make sense and i agree with you there is a definite flaw in that process unless he's just one of these i'm too proud i turned down that offer i'm not going back there so that's also possible that he doesn't want to lose and he thinks that the team sucks and I sign here long term and Hugh gets fired. I'm back to square one. And I don't want that. St- you know, it goes back to the Browns instability again. I don't know. Something's just not right. Well, and, and that so at the end of it, because it happened in back to back years with Mitchell Schwartz and Terrell Pryor, yeah. wildly different guys, but both guys that the Browns absolutely need to this day. Um, and they and they end up not not keeping them if their if their process is dictating well if you don't take it before free agency that we're we're going to pull these things that process needs to change i don't see any upside to it i've seen a lot of people talking about the brown on twitter saying well you know the browns have to stand by because what's to keep a guy from shopping and then blah 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 you know and you, you can't have hard fat you can't make up fake rules for yourself that guide your process you need to you need to be malleable and move around and and take advantage of situations when it unfolds i i totally agree um we also also have to remember that i'm not giving sashi a pass but th- th- this is still you know th- these are still infant contract negotiators who haven't really done this much and don't really you know they're they're flying blind a little bit too. And they're kind of feeling themselves out for what works and what doesn't one would think after the Mitch Schwartz thing last year that they would have learned, but it's also possible that maybe they just didn't want Mitch Schwartz anymore. I, you know, I, I, not that it's right. You know, to me, and I like, because a year later now they're signing guys to the, you know, they signed two offensive linemen because they saw how bad the line was last year. And every, I think we all can, uh, you know, agree that, if Schwartz and Mack were on that line last year, they, they wouldn't be this bad. But then again, now they got the number one pick. I was, right. uh, I've been saying forever, there's no glory in going five and 11 yet at five and 11. You might as well go one and 15 and get the top pick. Think right. about all those years. We went three and 13 or four and 12 and we picked fifth. And instead of getting Andrew luck, we got, you know, whoever. <laughs> so I don't know. Did you keep I, your tickets? Yes, I did. But I, I actually, sold two of my remaining four, which, uh, to, to, a, to a buddy of mine. So now it used to be, you know, we had four and it were, and, and, uh, my uncle had four. And then eventually it was, I had, you know, a buddy, of my, my uncle sold two and then I had six and wh- whatever it is. Now it's, I'm basically down to two tickets. That's it. And my, 
another cousin of mine who had six got rid of his. I, and I, I don't know how much longer I am going to be able to hold out. Unless we got I burned so badly this private. year that we we have Bad. not we yeah. have not renewed. Wow. Hmm. This is the first time since the eighties in the old stadium that we've not sure. had uh, had tickets because the way we looked at it was. You know, even if they're even if they're kind of good, by the time you know the bad weather hits, if we want to go to a game, they're going to sell for face value or less. Face value, you'll get them below, Craig. I mean, I last think so. year, last year in December, I think I sold my my tickets face value last year went from eighty. I think they were one ten or something. Or they were it averaged like one ten, which is, I mean, they were eighty five forever. And now they were they were up a little bit more, and you know certain games like the Cowboys was like a one hundred and forty dollar game, whereas you know other ones were a little bit cheaper. But I think the average would be one ten. I sold two games. I think each ticket for like forty five bucks was all I could get per ticket. And you were lucky <laughs> to get that. Yeah, the San Diego ticket. Oh, I, the San Diego tickets. I think I sold two for fifty. The the, the game before that might have been Pittsburgh. I sold. Yeah, I mean, but who wants to go and sit in that? No, and the the you other problem is that I did go to that Dallas game because nobody wanted those seats, and to be to have uh, the Browns the, the Cowboys be, home game, you yeah, mean? To, for the Browns to be <laughs> so there. bad that the stadium yeah. gets taken over, and uh, you know I hate to do this to you, but that was on the heels of the World Series where our stadium got yep. taken over there. I just I wanted to die. I hated it so much. Yeah, that was. And the Patriots took over the stadium last year too. When and when Brady you're when you're paying time. thousands of dollars to feel like you'd rather die than sit in your own stadium, you should probably just not renew your tickets. And you know what? I actually, now that I think about it, the Charger game, I'm thinking of two games ahead. I sold two of my four to the game before the Steeler game for for next to nothing. The Steeler tickets, someone from Pittsburgh bought, and then the Charger tickets, I gave away to our friend Butcher. Yep. He went, and he's like, I got to go every game now in your seats because we won. <laughs> <laughs> he was a good luck charm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's frustrating. Um, I do believe hey, – listen, I, 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 I like the way they're thinking. I like this route they're going, the analytical route, and doing something totally out of the box because they've tried it the normal way 85 times, and it hasn't worked. So let's try it this way. But it all comes back to this, Craig. None of this matters until they get a real quarterback. Because if they don't have a real quarterback, they can't win. It's just we haven't had a real a real quarterback since Bernie friggin' Kozar, the Lord, since we when I was nine years old and ten years old. So until we get a real quarterback that can actually excite people, none of this is going to matter, and we're going to continue to be in this death spiral. So what what does that mean to you for this off season in terms? Obviously, the draft is coming up, but you know the Jimmy Garoppolo stuff uh, continues to be tamped down or ramped up, depending on who you listen to. What would you do? How do how do you solve this thing, or do you say like I don't know? I'm just a fan. Fix it. Okay, I'm. I don't know. I'm just a fan. Fix it. Absolutely, I'm not being paid. <laughs> but if it were, if it were, if if. if Here's my list of preferences in terms of quarterback. Number one, I, I think you got to go and get Garoppolo. I think he's that good. Um, I would give number 12 and two twos. Sure, why not? What, what, whatever it costs short of the number one pick. A good friend of mine who lives in Chicago who's a diehard Browns fan, he thinks that they should get – if they, sh- if they believe that one of these quarterbacks is their guy and, he's not gonna, and he is not going to be there by 12 – and he's going to go number two, you know, to San Francisco. Like my buddy, and, and I'm of this opinion too. The, the the only college quarterback that does it for me is Deshaun Watson. I don't care about the measurables. I watch the guy play the biggest games in college football and be a complete stud and leader. And he just, to me, is the guy that I would take. I know the accuracy can be a problem at times, but to me, he just – you know, why isn't, why can't he be like that Prescott? I mean, it, I don't know. I, I'm a Watson guy. I'm I'd a Kaiser guy, by the way. Are you? Okay. Well, we'll get into that in a second. But I would go Garoppolo, throw whatever it costs short of the number one pick to get Garoppolo if they really say he's not going anywhere. It seems to me like the moves the Patriots are making reek of 
we are going all in now, you know, trading first round pick for Brandon cooks, uh, you know, signing Stefan Gilmore. They're, they're, they're getting all these veteran guys and, and making trades and they have no, I think they have no first or second round draft pick there. I just feel like they're going all in now and they're going to keep Garoppolo. They'll pay him what they have to pay him. I, I don't think he's going to be traded, but to me, the guy I want is Watson next. And he's probably going to be gone by 12. So you, you, if, if you really believe that's your guy, then you need to trade up and get him. My, so my buddy who, who has, who is Mr. Deshaun Watson thinks that if they know he's going to be gone at two, that the Browns have to dra- draft him at one and not miles Garrett, because in his opinion, it's quarterback. It's a quarterback league. Miles Garrett can, could be great, but is he going to win you a Super Bowl? No, but if you believe that Deshaun Watson can win you a Super Bowl, then you have to take him no matter what. I understand the line of thinking. I happen to disagree with that completely because I think Garrett is a once every fifteen year talent uh, with with his speed and I mean, I mean, how about he's running forty faster than running backs? But all you have to do is look at the Texans, and that kind of does support your buddy. I, I understand yeah, that's, it. That's that's what he uses every time too. You can have J.J. Watt, you can have Clowney, you can have the the best defense in the history of the league, and it still might not get it done. Yep, it's very true. I mean, they got to the playoffs thanks to a terrible division, and, I mean, Tom Savage was starting in the playoffs for them. They they had no chance to win. I mean, it is true. But credit, you, credit to the Texans, the and I, I know the Texans are – you know, because the Browns traded for Brock Osweiler and took that contract off their hands. But credit to them for for going balls out to to find that quarterback, and 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 it didn't work, and they moved on right away. And now they're on to Plan C, D, E, and F, whatever. But at least at least they took a shot at it. All it cost them was money. You know what? And I I think it was a great move. And I also think the Browns were. It was a great move by the Browns. Like I don't understand the national people that were criticizing the Browns, it was money that was never going to be used. So why not go trade up to get, why not trade up and get an extra second round pick for a four? It's not like that money was going to be dead money regardless. But do you think the, do you think the Texans were stupid for signing Brock Osweiler to begin with? Or or is this just the, the cost of going and making a shot? I, well here, it's all hindsight. Now I couldn't believe they gave him that kind of money because I never thought he was that good. But they took a shot. It failed, and they got out of it after one year. So you got to credit them for, you know, recognizing that mistake. The Browns have taken plenty of shot. I mean, they haven't taken a quarterback shot, but, you know, how many co- quarterbacks? Here, here's the thing: no good quarterback, or I shouldn't say good. Hey, yeah, I'll go with good. No good quarterback is ever going to reach free agency unless it's a Cousins Washington situation where it's so untenable that the organization is such a giant clusterfuck that he just says, I'm going to take the franchise tag and I'm hitting for the second year in a row and then I'm done. It, or you know, or you're the, the Seahawks they, like, you're the Seahawks, and you get to take a shot at Matt Flynn. But what they did was they took Matt Flynn, who was an average quarterback, and then they drafted a third rounder behind him yep. just so happened that Russell Wilson turned out to be great. That's a route that you can take. Take one of these middle-of-the-road guys, hope he's a bridge, like what the Niners are probably doing with Hoyer and Barkley, hoping that that bridge – and I'm, I got to believe they're going to be drafting a quarterback and, you know, to develop. I mean, what, doesn't Watson just seem perfect for that Kyle Shanahan offense? He, I, so he, he does. does to me, but. Um, yeah. I, but I, I, and I, I said I, I'm a Kaiser guy. I'm not sure exactly why, but I'm a Kaiser guy. Um, you, I, you like that 2015 tape, huh? Well, he was and great in 2015. Even beyond the tape, and I've said this, like, look, I'm never going to be good enough to – analyze a quarterback like a scout would and his mechanics and all that kind of stuff but i saw a guy who went through an absolutely miserable season and still handled it like a pro not a sniveling baby not you know uh, his measurables were all there for him to be one of the top recruits at one of the one of the biggest schools and now he's gone through horrible adversity and and came out smelling okay so if he adds up yeah. to what being a first rounder in the draft I'm not knocking him that Notre Dame stunk this year. I totally agree. And what's interesting is, had he come out the year before, he's the number one quarterback, no doubt. And everybody loved him. And, you know, because of how good he was the year before. I like him. Uh, and I, I 
you know, I keep hearing that Arizona is the is the team. Bruce Arians really likes him and really wants him. So that doesn't you, you know, surprise groom me. Him, groom him. It's a you know, big guy, big arm, perfect for that offense. I mean, you could see that being a good, you know, getting mentored by Carson Palmer for a year and then taking over. I think that would be a good fit. I wouldn't be averse to Kaiser at twelve. I you know, I would put him after Watson in my pecking order. The guy I don't want is Trubisky, and mostly it has to do with the fact that the pressure that he will be on because he's from Mentor is is because you know how Cleveland loves their logo boys. I just it, – it's, it's to me a giant mistake. I also would not – But if he's legit, him. he'll be able to handle it. It won't be a big deal. I know. I just don't think that he's that good. That's most That's of fair. And, and, and I, I mean – I don't. I'm not crazy about a guy who started 14 games in in college. I watched him. You know the big games that he played. He was not great, and just all of a sudden he just kind of came out of all of a sudden came out of nowhere. I guess Carson. You could say the same thing about Carson Wentz, and the jury's still out on him. But I don't know. I just. I, I, I don't, I'm not great on the local guy story here. I, I just. It, Cleveland, nobody loves local boy comes home and does good quite like Brown stands, right? I mean, does, does no, and it's just that that pressure will just be, it'll be annoying to be a fan with all the Browns fans calling for him just because he's from Cleveland. That it's might, like Hoyer. That might Hoyer be that might love. be the worst logic I've ever heard. By the way, um, I agree with you. I, I, it'll be logic, an, I, I agree with you. It'd be but annoying. But how how well would the Browns have done over the last five years if they drafted every? first or second round projected player from the Buckeyes and and we grew up with that like oh they should draft a Buckeye and the Buckeyes didn't produce draft picks back in the in the 90s the way they do today um but you know it makes change. no sense the, St- the Steelers love Ohio State and the Browns never took Ohio State players but it's not even the, the Ohio State thing is is different than the actual well you know he grew up being a Browns fan and he you know I don't know it's like Hoy- it's like the Hoyer thing Everyone wanted Hoyer so badly until he was out there and, and decided that he wasn't good enough. We need a we need a true star quarterback. No more of this, you know. And I just don't think I just think Trubisky's going to be just a guy. Jag, just a guy. Well, and that's and that's players. fair. That's fair. I'm not. I'm but not super. I'm, I'm not listen, super I'm like high you, on. I'm, just, I'm not super high on Trubisky either. You know, I I, I think uh, I think Kaiser. Is is, but I wouldn't complain about Watson. Again, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend to know what I don't know. Like I can't, I right. can't accurately evaluate these guys. And and you and I don't get to sit in two hour interviews with them to figure out if they got their head screwed on the right way. That's that's the one thing about Watson. I mean, I've seen him more in interviews uh, than anybody else. And you know, just because he played on such a big stage for the last two years and played in so many big games. He just, to me, he just has it. And everything you read is that he's a great leader and that his teammates all love him and, you know, no excuses, hard worker, you know, all the things that you want in a leader, of, you know, of your team. So, you know, if we're, if, if Garoppolo's out, that's the guy I want a quarterback. Yeah, but it, I'm I'm with you on the Garoppolo thing too. Like, I don't, again, I can't tell you that he's going to be a great NFL quarterback, but if he's worthy of being traded for at all, it does uh, short of that number one overall pick. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it costs because he fills a need yep. that the Browns have been trying to fill for, you know, since Bernie Kosar. Period. Yeah, and you're 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 one hundred percent right with, you know, what you were saying with like you know the Texans. Like they took their shot. Sometimes you got to take your shot. They took it with Osweiler. It didn't work, but hey, they took it. They, yeah, when it doesn't they, work, you, out you, of it. you right. trade them. You trade them. Um, to somebody uh, and give away picks, and then you you circle up your uh, your cap space for Tony Romo. It's crazy how unique and and that's that's the one thing that I really give Sashi credit for is they they did something totally unique and 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 I'm just probably I'm sure Dee Podesta was in on you know obviously in on it too. It was just such a unique thing and and it you know I I love the out of the box thinking and that's you know that. At least we're at least it's not boring and different right now. Yeah. I mean, I mean, at least, I mean, at least it's not boring. It's just different. Yeah. We, we could be, you know, having the same old, same old football guy. You know, you know, signing. You know, you know, not taking any chances. I just give me something different. It's, it's been the same old crap for too long. 
All right, I've gone on. I've I've dragged you around too long before hitting NCAA, but let's do it. Oh, real, no problem. Let's do it real quick, man. So, um, obviously, uh, we know where your rooting interests are, but tell us kind of what you make of the field. You watch more regular season college basketball than anybody I know. So, tell us kind of your 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 take on the field, and maybe give us a couple of your uh, your outside the box Cinderella picks. Well, you know, here's what's interesting. I am more of a chalk person. I think that, you know, a lot of people go with the, hey, you know, picking ra- a lot of random teams to, to, you know, go deep. I just, this season, it, I, I am more than any, I just, I feel like there are really only six or seven teams that can win it all. To me, the only teams that can win it all are Arizona, UCLA, Gonzaga, Duke, Carolina, Kansas, Six, and I'm forgetting one other one. Who am I forgetting? Duke. Uh, none of the Big Ten teams. I don't think Kentucky can win. Villanova? Um, oh, Villanova. That's the one. Yeah, those are the only teams I think can win uh, to win the, the actual title. So you can narrow it down to that. The, the way the draw came out, you know, the committee does some strange things sometimes. I don't understand. Like, if I was a Kentucky fan, I would be – this is the second year in a row they've gotten completely screwed. It just – because of their – affinity now for making sure that it's geographically placed. The West is super weak. Like if I was an Arizona fan, I'd be like, yeah, print my tickets to the elite eight at a minimum. And we'll probably be going to the final four. They have the weakest number one in Gonzaga. And because, and, and you compare that to where the South is just if, if I'm a Kentucky fan, just to get to the final four, you're going to have to beat the most criminally underseeded team in the history of the tournament, Wichita state who's 30 and four is a 10 which is a joke. The, the, the Ken Palm uh, uh, top 100, which Ken Palm is a you know, super analytical guy. He does things in a completely different way than all the other uh, you know, RPI and all those numbers. I look at Ken Palm because he, he does more uh, efficiency stuff than anybody else. But Ken Palm has them as the ninth best team in the country. And they're a 10 seed? Wow. Okay. So Kentucky's got to beat Wichita State in round two, assuming that Wichita State would beat Dayton, which is no given because Dayton's a good team. Uh, and, and then they have UCLA, who shouldn't be the, a three seed. They should be a two. And that's just to get to the Sweet 16. And then they would have to beat North Carolina. And that's just to get to the championship. So that's ridiculous when you look at, you know, Arizona's route as a two or Duke's route as a two. Like, if you look at the East where Duke and Nova are, Duke and Nova, to me, it's, it's a complete walk to the Elite Eight for Duke and, and Villanova. I don't know how I would be stunned if those teams did not get to the elite eight and meet in the garden. So uh, as for sleeper teams, you know, the only team there, the middle Tennessee state over uh, Minnesota is, is one that I think will happen. Um, You know, uh, let's see Rhode Island over Creighton's not really an upset, but I think that's a, that's 11 over over six. I wouldn't be shocked if East Tennessee state beat Florida in the first round. Florida's very – they're up – Florida's the four with Villanova. The SEC was garbage the entire year other than Kentucky, and I don't, I don't see how they're going to have a second weekend team. Um, as for actually going deep, I don't see any of those – you know, I don't see anything more than the Sweet 16 run by any Cinderella. So I, I would say my final four, I haven't really gone through and done it already, but just like, you know, top of the – top of my mind, I would say Arizona and Villanova, East and West – and Kansas and North Carolina, and and I know that's super chalky. That's three ones and a and a two. But I just that's to me. There's six teams that can win. There's six or seven teams that can win, and four of them will be in the final four. So what what about your team? Okay, so I love you know. Normally, I think Kansas is draw every year. I, I find myself saying, "Oh well, you know, oh it's so hard, such a hard draw." I don't see anybody challenging us. I mean, I think the second round winner of Michigan state, Miami, you know, everyone's going to pick Michigan state because it is though, but they're not going to win that game. Miami's going to beat Michigan state. Their, their guards are much better and they're an experienced team. If KU can just get out of that first weekend, which obviously they're going to beat the 16, but if they can beat Miami or Michigan state, the, the next two rounds, the sweet 16 and the elite eight are in Kansas city, which will be glorified home games. And we will have our fan base, Lawrence is 45 minutes from Kansas city. It'll be a KU home game. You know, those two games, 
I'm hoping that Iowa State does not beat, does not get to the Sweet 16. And another strange thing that the committee had was, you know, the Big 12 champion, Big 12 tournament champion as the five and possibly meeting the Big 12 champion in the Sweet 16. Doesn't make any sense to me. But I think we're going to end up getting to the Elite Eight, playing Louisville, and Louisville will be a real tough matchup. But I just, our guards, Kansas has the best backcourt in the country with Frank Mason and Devontae Graham. And Josh Jackson's a superstar who's going to be drafted in the top three next year. And this just feels like they played more. So KU played 12 games this year that were decided by 10 points or less. And they made a bunch of different comebacks. They only lost one of them, which was in the Big 12 tournament against TCU when Josh Jackson was suspended. They played so many close games. They have the ultimate closer in Frank Mason who's going to be national player of the year. And this is is the experience of a team with a superstar freshman as you're going to find in the country. So if they can stay out of foul trouble with Landon Lucas, the, the, the one quality big man we have, I see us getting to the Final Four. I don't see us winning a national championship, though. Well, all right. <laughs> there you go. That was a lot in a, in a short period of time, but... No, it's perfect. It's say. perfect because, right. you know, by the, time, by the time the tournament actually kicks off, nobody knows nothing. Well, I do. You you are right. I do watch more college basketball than anybody that you will, that you will talk to. That that's for sure. I mean, I'm, you know, next next to the Indians, KU basketball is the most important thing, you know, sports wise for me. And I I love the sport, and I always have, and I am pretty dialed in. I'll uh, I'll put my I'll put my bracket out there on Twitter um, when I actually get around to doing it. But uh, yeah, hopefully it works out for KU, and I'll be in Arizona for uh, for the Final Four because I've been been holding off for that one. So. Are you a uh, are you a one bracket guy or do you do like twenty yeah. seven? No, I do one. That's it. No changes. You do one bracket, one bracket and then guy. you enter it into multiple competitions. No, I do one bracket in. Well, I, I take it back. I will enter uh, my my work. I have to do it for work, but like I'm in one the same one every year, and I'll do that one. But yeah, I'm a one bracket guy. I don't make any changes. I go with. I just look at it, and the other thing is, I don't study like Tuesday or Wednesday when I decide to actually do it, I will just go boom, 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 and be done in two minutes. Because if you over, you know, overthinking the stuff is not worth it. I just go with my first impulse and call it a day. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, well, it's always, uh, it's always a productive hour when I get you on the phone yeah. and we talk about sports, man. It's been great. Thank you so much for having me, as always. You are the best. We love the podcast. Keep up the good work. And, uh, yeah. WFNY for life, baby. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for listening, everybody out there. Tell a friend. And until next time, it's been the waitingfornextyear.com podcast.